So if you have a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I want to start this morning in the middle of the book of Romans. Usually we don't want to start in the middle of anything, but chapters 1 through 7 make one very specific point that is carried on through the next section of the book of Romans. And the, the thrust of this is, is that God has made it possible for us to understand who we are who we are as people, individuals, but more importantly, who we are in Christ and what's available to each and every believer through the power of the Holy Spirit if we'll simply latch on to it. And there's one specific word that is found throughout Romans chapters 1 through 7, or if it's not the specific word, it is the indication and the, the definition of the word that I'm going to talk about. So let me begin reading in... Romans chapter 3, I'm going to read five verses, and then we're going to jump to Romans chapter 8. And then we will have covered the basic premise of the first half of this letter or this book. So in verse 21, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, through faith in Christ Jesus, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation through his blood, in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. Amen. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So there's a word in there, and it's justified. The, the first seven ver chapters of Romans chapter uh, of the book of Romans is, is the foundation of that God has justified us, has granted justification to everyone who believes through what Christ accomplished in his life, his crucifixion, his burial, and certainly through his resurrection. And because what, of what Christ has done, that means that those that believe are pronounced as being righteous and treated as righteous by God. So when you profess faith in Jesus Christ and you become one of his children, you go from, from a person who must obey the law which is not possible, to one who is free from the bonds of the law. And we call that grace by faith through Jesus. And so when we look at, well, who am I? If you're a believer in Christ, you're free. You are free from, from all that, that, that binds the, the flesh that, that we still are, are wrapped in, all of our, our mindsets, all of our presuppositions, all of our behaviors, all of our habits. doesn't mean they just end, but God has given us the capacity on which to, to work through and live through and make better choices and live better lives, not because of the law, but because of what Christ has done for us and in us and to us. And so as Paul is, is writing this, he's saying, guys, I just want you to get this, that if you are a follower of Christ and you profess faith in Jesus Christ, then you are, you are justified. It's as if your sin didn't exist. God wiped that away. It does not mean we won't continue to sin because of the flesh and because we're human and we just like what we like. But then we get to chapter 8, and chapter 8 begins with this word, Therefore, and I just told you what it's there for. We're justified in Christ, not by works, not by anything that we can do, feel, think, or say. Jesus, as we sing, paid it all, and all to him we truly do owe. So Paul begins chapter 8, which is really just another paragraph in a letter, 
Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No longer are we at odds at enmity with God. We're not condemned for not, for not being who we think we should be. We're not condemned by being what other people think we should be. We're not condemned by the law because the law points us to what's wrong and what's right, but it has no bearing in salvation. But we're bound in the Holy Spirit. So God has given us the gift of himself in his spirit, into the lives and hearts of everyone who believes, and that supplants the law. Because the law was designed to point us towards our need for God, but the law doesn't go away because of that. The importance of, of the Ten Commandments, just which is kind of a summary of God's moral character, it doesn't do away with that, but it puts us in a different perspective or puts it in a different perspective, that we, we're free from the bonds of the law and the bonds of sin, but we can't neglect the character of God. And if the character of God is, is wrapped up in, let's just say, don't steal, and we feel like we deserve what Charles has, and so we're in mass going to go and take everything that Charles has because we feel like it. Well, God's moral law says you can't do that. And as a Christian, it's more than just the moral law. It's we're ingrained with the Holy Spirit and we have the capacity within us because of his power to say that's not who I am anymore. Have you ever told somebody who, who knew you before you were a Christian, I'm not that person anymore? I don't do what I used to do, and it's not because I can't. It's because I choose not to, because God has freed me to make different choices. Yeah, I fall short of God's glory. We all do, and I don't say that lightly. That's part of life. But at the end of this, this section this morning, Paul's going to give us a word that, that is strikingly similar to, to what he writes throughout almost all of his letters that helps me anyway see that this is more than just a, a feeling or a want to, but it's a possibility. See, you don't have to be who you are. If you're not who God, God said you could be, you don't have to be that person. You don't have to do the things that you do if you don't want to do them and you know it's against God. If you're a Christian and if you followed Jesus into salvation, you, you, you're not condemned anymore. We live in a world that, that likes to break and beat people down. You're not good enough. You did this, you're scarred for life, you, you're not worthy anymore because of this or, or that. And God says, that is not true. What is true is that I will forgive you of your sin, if you confess your sin, he's faithful to forgive that sin in all unrighteousness. So if you've confessed your sin and you've laid it at the feet of Jesus, then that sin is in God's hand. Now it's up to us to make different choices. But to continually allow our past or even our present, if we've, if we've confessed it, to derail our walk with Christ... That's not how God designed Christianity. God designed Christianity so that we could find our identity in Christ. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. We could never be good enough. But the truth is, is that we've been justifi justified by Christ and there is no condemnation. And it's not just, there's not a little bit. There is no, God does not condemn us. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you've done. He also knows exactly who you can be. And he gives us the capacity to be that person. Verse 2 says this, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The spirit of life is literally the gospel, that Jesus came, 
lived a sinless, perfect life and gave his life for the sin of humanity. And he defeated death. He defeated Satan on the cross. And when he arose from the grave, he was victorious in the plan of God until he returns as the conquering king. So God has given his followers a new life. Paul says we're new creations. I said that last week. That God has made us people who we couldn't be apart from him. And with that comes the freedom to live life according to his will. See, and that, that's, what, that's why the, the law has to take a back seat to the gospel. Because the law just points you to where you're wrong. If you're stealing, don't steal. If you kill, don't kill. That's, that's against God's moral character. But when Jesus came, he, he narrowed it down to two things. And you know what they are. Love God and love your neighbor. And if everything you do is born out of, out of that agape love for God and, and, and your fellow human being, then all of a sudden the rules and regulations have no no bearing on you because you're living a life that is, is focused and tailored on living for God. I mean, John, when he wrote John 3.16, I, 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 I can't imagine him not thinking through that. For God so loved the world, the people of the world, the ethne. And yet John was, was, was a Hebrew with Rome oppressing the nation. There was a priestly system that was horribly corrupt. There were Pharisees and there were Sadducees camps and, and there were, there were, everything was against the everyday person. And then Jesus came along. And Jesus said, I've come to fulfill all that you know, all that you've heard about God. And so when John wrote, for God so loved the world, the magnitude of that is something that I truly don't think that we can fathom because honestly, we don't necessarily always love the world or the people of the world. We might like love pockets of the people. I mean, I believe we love each other and I thank God for that. But I know there's people in our lives that we don't quite think meet our standard that have a lifestyle that is contrary to to God contrary to us that do things that that hurt instead of help that exploit instead of help and yet when John wrote for God so loved the world he included all of those people that we truly for the most part want nothing to do with and I say we God's people. Because we want people to, and again, I'm using the we as in the corporate, not just monument. The church wants people to come in who have already gotten cleaned up. Who are on the same journey that we're on. And yet the good news of Christ, the gospel of Christ is, is that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't lose that. Because that renders God powerless. And God is all power. He can never be rendered powerless. But he, he gave us and he transformed us so that we might be able to touch other people and take the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done in our life through the power of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit so that someone else's life might be transformed, that they might become new creations. So when Paul writes in verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free, we're free men and women. The only, if we could get the love God and love others right, nothing else would have any, any true, true bearing on us because we're, we're living the life that is so God-focused and so God-centered that we only want what he wants. And then we can go and we can read things in the context that it's intended Instead of nitpicking and pulling out things and going, oh, well, you shouldn't steal. No, 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 that's wrong. Shame on you. But what if you could say, but you know, God wants to give you something that you can't have of your own accord, a brand new life. 
a brand new way of thinking, a brand new way of living, a brand new way of believing. And then he does this. God does this. He said, I'm not going to leave you just to your own belief system. I'm not going to leave you just to your own feelings. I'm going to gift every single one of you who are followers of Christ, my spirit. And my spirit will guide you into my truth. He'll comfort you. He'll challenge you. He'll chastise you. He'll speak on your behalf when you have no strength in which to even cry out to God. And he will give you all that you need to be all that you can be. For the law of the spirit of life, verse 2 again, in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, those that don't believe have, have no other option. They have no God. And even if they have a small G God, they still have no God. There's only one God. The maker, the creator of the, of the world, all that exists. And the one who, who, who made it possible for us to relate to him in, in a, a real relationship. And not as enemies, but literally as, as children. We're joint heirs with Christ. That's who you are. That's who we are. And it's got to make a difference in our lives or something's wrong with us. The world cannot defeat God. The world cannot defeat his children. The children can live defeated, but we don't have to be defeated because we'll never truly be defeated because the moment we breathe our last breath or that trumpet sounds and Jesus returns... It's glory. So it's literally thriving in this, in this fallen world with everything that is, is just in shambles, it seems at times, all around us. And God says, well, this is where you are. This is who you are. Now be who you can be. Change your world. Someone came up to me a couple days ago, actually it's been about a week ago, and said, I'm so thankful for you and your wife. And I said, why? Because you literally saved our lives. I said, that's not possible. And they said, yes, it is. Because here's what you did. You loved us when we were unlovable. You cared about us when no one else cared. You told us through your actions that there's a, a, a better way, a different way. And then you introduced us to this body of believers. And they were just like you. They just loved us. They allowed us. And now all of a sudden God has done things in, in our family, an extended family, that I can only attribute to God. And I fear that if I hadn't been introduced to you, not because I'm special or that Diana is special, but because God was working in us. And I said, well, thank the Lord. Oh, he said, I do. But I also thank the Lord for you and for this church because you saved us. Not from eternal damnation, but our family is thriving now. Praise God. See, that's what we get to do. And we don't always do it right. We don't always say the right thing. But it's the fact that we're in the game. That we're just walking and living for Christ daily. Keeping our eyes and our ears and, and our hearts open for, for, for needs. For ways that we can help. For the ways that we may engage someone that we're not so wrapped up and caught up in our own little world that we don't see the broken. And if we don't see the broken, we can't help the broken. We can't impart the gospel of Jesus Christ into their lives. That there is a way, there is a truth, and there is a life. 
to be found in Jesus. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. We've got to be careful that we don't use this as a hammer or a baseball bat. Then that, that, that we don't say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, and, and, and be a, a world of, of can'ts. We can do whatever we want to do. That's the freedom we have. God said, you have to decide. You have to choose. Are you going to live for my glory or are you going to live for self? So if we beat people up with the law, and the law is not, Im not unimportant. But Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We all sang that as kids pretty much if we were in church. Don't even need to have the, have the lyrics on the screen. As a kid, isn't that what we try to teach our kids? Is that Jesus loves you. But if you beat up on your brother, he might not. <laughs> no. We always want to, it seems as if we always want to add something to it. Just don't steal. Well, how about if we did this? How about if we said, Lord, I know this person has a problem with theft. Lord, is there a way that you can use me to help with that issue? Lord, maybe even without naming names, I could gather around me, maybe even around this person, and actually lift them up in prayer and, and, and engage them and allow the Holy Spirit of God to do the transforming work in that person's life that he's done in my life and in your life. So that God is seen, he's glorified, and he's recognized. See, it's hard to glorify God if you don't recognize God. If you don't recognize who he is, and, and I'm not talking about us as believers, but as non-believers, God draws those that don't believe to himself, and he uses his kids as instruments to put them on display in a very healthy way hopefully, that God is forgiving. Yes, he is just. He is loving, but he also chastises. He's all things because he is all things. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus paid it all. See, the law, the rights and the wrongs of the world can't save you. All the, the sacrifices and offerings have no bearing on, on your salvation. Jesus has every bearing on our salvation. We didn't bend the knee to whoever. We bent the knee to Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Because the Word says that the world can only be saved through Him. And so we have, we have that identifying marker in our lives. Jesus. He's the one that saves us. But he's not only the one that, 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 that brings salvation, he also makes it possible to live life. And not just to live life, not just to get along, but to live life in the full. To have the best life possible. And you might be thinking, well, my life really is in the tank. I really hate my life right now. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm just waiting for God to do something. But what are you doing? Well, I'm just waiting. There are periods of time when we must wait. Okay? But you only know if it's a waiting period is if you're walking with God. 
I love what Henry Blackaby, uh, the writer of Experiencing God, wrote. He, he, said, he said, don't just do something. Hurry up and wait. Just wait if you've turned it over to God, if you've prayed about it, if you're living a life of faith, then God's going to do it in God's timing because his thoughts aren't our thoughts, his time isn't our thoughts. He, he does things when he wants to, when it's best for us. And so sometimes maybe we just need to hurry up and wait. Maybe it's time to just press on, as we sing quite often. But you can't know unless you're walking by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. For what the law could not do, verse 3 again, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. As an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. That just is a summary of what I've been saying. But, uh, let's see. So that the requirement of the law might not be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That one word that I said earlier is that word walk, and I know I've used it several times this morning. That it's a habitual way of living. It's a way of life, that the walk. It's not, oh, I'm going to go walk a 5K this morning, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to walk down to the grocery store. No, it's, it's a way of life. And the power that is in the way of life that God gives us is according to the Spirit not according to circumstances, not according to the law, not according to feelings, but according to what God has accomplished in Christ Jesus. And so we have the freedom. I remember one of our last races, Diana years ago used to run. We were doing, a, I think it was a 10 mile or something in, in Palisade. It was a 5K and a, a six, whatever it was. And Diane and I were running side by side. And all of a sudden, and, and trust me, I, I was never a fast runner. If it was downhill, I could, I could hold my own. <laughs> but about halfway through, something, I don't know if it was in my brain, it was in my muscles, but something just clicked. And I said something like this to Diana, I got to go. And for the next three and a half, four miles, I did my best race ever. I felt so free. I wasn't exhausted. <laughs> you know, there was no, no, no muscle cramps. It was just, it was, there was so, it, I felt so free as I'm running along the river. And I mean, my time was the best time I'd ever had in my whole life. I've never experienced that again, certainly in racing and running. But there was that, that, that moment when it just clicked that I don't have to, I don't have to just keep the pace that I'm keeping. It feels like there's more. It feels like I can do more, like I can be more. And all of a sudden, I just, I literally took off. Three hours later, Diana can know. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> but th that's what God wants to do for us. He wants, to, wants us to realize that, that, that we bind ourselves. We let others bind us. We let our past bind us. We let our desires bind us. And, and literally, God, God would say, stop it. You're shortchanging me, God would say. And if you're shortchanging me, then you're certainly shortchanging yourself. So, stop it. How do we stop it? How, how do we stop the cycle that has kept us bound. I'm going to ask if you'll quiet your heart, bow your head, and I'm going to pray for us. And in this prayer, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how we can do this. Because he wants us to live the victorious Christian life, even when it seems we're living against all odds. Gracious Heavenly Father, 
I come before you this morning, Lord, and I want to pray for myself, but I want to pray for all of these people that are in this building and that might be watching online, Lord. Lord, I know you have a plan for us. I know you have a purpose. I know you have a way for us to live. And so, Lord, I pray this morning, God, that we, number one, would be willing to confess our sin to you. Lord, that we would not try to, to live a lie, trying to fool ourselves, trying to fool others, and trying to fool you. Lord, that we would just ask for your forgiveness as we confess our sin. Lord, I realize that that's the beginning place of healing. That's the beginning place of righteousness for those of us who believe is, is when we communicate and we commune with you. So God, I pray that, that each one of us would take the time to evaluate ourselves. And then, Lord, I pray that, that we would become people of consistency. That we would consistently make the time to pray to you every single day. To read your word every single day. If it's in a devotion, it's in a devotion. Whatever, whatever, Lord, we need to do, whatever we can do. And Lord, after we pray and after we do our devotion, Lord, that we would intentionally give you our day. Say, Lord, or something like it. Lord, I don't know what today is going to bring. Lord, I'm in a good mood, I'm in a bad mood, I feel good, I feel bad, whatever it might be. But Lord, I, I, I want to honor you today. God, I don't want to have my blinders on so that I don't see what goes on around me. God, use me today for your purpose, for your honor, and for your glory. God, help those three things to change me so that I might mature in the faith so that I might love and, 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 and appreciate those things that are different than I am, that I might speak the truth in love, that I might be a person who, who cares. And Lord, help me just to live today for you. And Lord, at the end of the day, may we, maybe before we put our head on the pillow, say, Lord, thank you for the day you've blessed me with. God, I don't understand why this happened or that happened. But God, I want to give you the, the glory because today, Lord, I, I sought your face. I sought your path. God, help me to walk in your way tomorrow. Put the people in, in front of me, Lord, that I might be able to touch with you. Oh, and Lord Jesus, please speak to my heart. Holy Spirit, comfort me. Lord, encourage me and strengthen me because I can't do this by myself. And Lord, I know, I know just working harder isn't going to accomplish that. So Lord, stir your spirit in my life. God, help me to walk faithfully with you tomorrow and draw closer to you through my faithfulness. And through the gift of salvation, the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of grace that you bestowed on a very unworthy person. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for making it possible for, for me to have options. For the prospect of becoming the person you want me to be. So, Lord, just guide me. I'll walk with you today, and I'll walk with you tomorrow. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you do that, it's a great place to start. See, work takes a place that it probably shouldn't take in our lives. Relationships take a place where they probably shouldn't take in our lives. And when we, when we intentionally put God where God belongs, then everything else has a place. And when we are habitually walking with God, 
then those things began to, to become known to us. I mean, you've got to have had an unhealthy relationship or an unhealthy job or an unhealthy healthy something. See, with God, he's like, no. I, I, yeah, it is, it's unhealthy, but let me help you deal with it. If you put me first, then I'll work it all out for you. But you got to walk with me. That habitual lifestyle of faith. I'm going to ask if you'll stand. We're going to sing a song, and it's the same one we sang last week. It's just as I am. He says that you, you can be okay. You can be okay. You can have hope for today and for tomorrow. But it's in him. Father, I pray that you'll protect us, watch over us. Father, may we bless you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.